Good morning. I hope you're having a great day. The snow has finally melted here, but now we've got ice and mud on the trails. I know, it's always something, right? The name of this channel is The Caffeinated Bible. The goal of this channel is to help stimulate you to read your Bible, interpret and teach it in a much more informed manner. My name is David Paris, and for the past 20 plus years, I've been teaching seminary and graduate schools, and I hope to take what I've been teaching there and bring it to you on YouTube. Right now, I'm going through a series on narrative or Bible stories. How do you read and interpret a narrative? And today we've come to the element of a narrative called plot, which sounds rather sinister, doesn't it? Is there a plot behind this video? What? You guys want a treat? Come here. Sit. Don't bite my fingers. Shake. Yeah. Good girl. I hope you have a good cup of coffee. And let's dig in. Before I jump into this video, I want to say that I'm giving away a copy of this book, Living Parables by Mark Boyer and Corbin Cole. And if you want to know how to win a copy of this book, which is a great illustration of trying to take the parables that were told in the context of Jesus' Galilean agrarian countryside and make them contemporary for today, stick around to the end of the video and I'll tell you how to win a copy of this. Now, when it comes to biblical narratives, Scholars have been studying this for the past couple hundred years, but most of the time their focus has been upon how the stories got formed together. Their goal then is to try and understand the history of Israel and the development of the Israelite religion. Most of the results have been highly speculative and they're accepted in some schools or not, but there's been some good methods that have been developed off this. For the past 40 years, though, there's been a real shift in the attention not to try and historically reconstruct the text, but rather to look at how the biblical stories operate as narratives. Without going into next week's video too much, we can kind of look at the role of narrators and readers in a story in the following way. The narrators are like the composers of a musical score. The composer has some idea of the music they want to write, and then they write it down on a sheet of music. The readers or the performers then, then take those little black marks on the page and then bring them back to life by performing them as a musical score, or in our case, as someone who reads the little black marks on the page and creates meaning out of them. And just like a musical composer will put the different notes, timing, beats, crescendos, various things like this within the text, the narrator of a story also has different features at their disposal then to really create what they hope will be the way the readers will understand and interpret the story. Now, plot is one of these devices that a narrator has to work with. They give coherence to the story or think of it as sort of the outline or the backbone to the story. But plot also serves a very important human or psychological role as well. We understand who we are as an individual based upon this plot or this storyline that we construct and we tell about our personal lives. If I wanted you to know who I am, I would tell you about where I was born, grew up, went to school, my achievements, struggles, marriage, family, various things like this. That is how you would get to know me. I would tell you stories about who I am. And it's also how I understand myself. I understand who I am based upon the achievements or the struggles, where I came from, what I've done in my life. And there's an excellent book in regard to this. It's written by Charles Gherkin and it's called Living Human Documents. And if you're interested, he takes a narrative approach towards counseling, understanding the stories that we've told about our lives as to how we shape our identity and help us also to overcome maybe some of the challenges that we're facing psychologically. And I'll put a link to that down below. Okay, so where were we? Oh yes, plot and narrative. Now narratives and stories are very different from propositional truth or propositional logic. And thank God it is. Could you imagine if the Bible was written like a Microsoft Word manual? 
trying to read through that where it's just giving you propositional ideas one after another. Rather, by placing it within stories, we can relate to the people in it. One of the big ways that narratives or stories differ from propositional logic is the freedom that the author has in rearranging elements within their story or choosing what to focus on. Even, for example, with this camera, I've got it set up so it's facing me. I don't have it facing the sidewall or back that direction. You're only seeing a small sliver of this room. And I've chosen that because I'm trying to tell you a story. I'm trying to communicate something to you. And I've selected the perspective from which you're going to view this. The same thing with the story. The narrator takes a perspective, but they also choose what they're going to tell you and how and when they're going to tell you. The author may have experienced events A, B, C, D in that particular order historically. But when they tell you the story, they might make it D, A, B, C. They may change the order around. For example, I could construct a plot of my making coffee upstairs, and I could have a number of sequential steps from making the coffee to coming down and teaching here. These sequential steps then present sort of what I would call the modern view of a narrative or a story. We like to have things in chronological order a lot of times. But a story does not have to be in chronological order. In fact, we really like it when people move things around. Consider the movie Titanic, which begins with the old lady going down the boat to throw that diamond off the boat over the spot where the Titanic lay at the bottom of the ocean. And then it jumps back in history to her experiences aboard the Titanic and that fateful journey. The amazing thing is our minds like it when we do that. Now where this is of particular relevance within the Bible is when authors might shift the historical events around in order to convey their message. They're trying to teach you something, remember that. A classic example of this is found in John's Gospel. In John chapter 2, you have the record of Jesus cleansing the temple. If you go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all have this in the last week of Jesus' life. John has it at the very start of Jesus' ministry. Now, if you look at the Bible as primarily conveying propositional truth, what happens is you get into either two problems here. On the one hand, the critical theorists then say, oh, look at this, John obviously doesn't know the events there. He wasn't, he wasn't an eyewitness, therefore he got things completely out of order. He's completely mistaken. Or you take the very conservative scholars on the other side who say, no, 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 no. What there was is really two cleansings of the temple. John recorded one, Matthew, Mark, and Luke recorded the other. This is sheer nonsense from my perspective. If there were two cleansings, surely somebody would have mentioned it because this was such an important event in Jesus' ministry. And also the idea that John got it wrong because he wasn't a witness is not right either. He brings it forward because he wants to tell you about it, it's important, but he doesn't want you to confuse it with why Jesus will be crucified in his gospel. For him, it's based upon John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In John's gospel, Jesus is crucified because this was God's plan. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have more of the social and historical situations that lead up to Jesus' confrontation with the religious and political authorities that then lead to his crucifixion. They all have a particular point they're trying to bring out and teach you, and one of the tools that they do this by is the order that they put events in within the plot. Another thing that we need to realize about narratives is that they're complex on the level of that there are micro, middle, and macro levels to narratives. Consider, for example, in Matthew 13, 44, the parable of the sower, which reads, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. This parable is a micro-narrative. It's one verse long, one sentence in the Greek, Yet it conveys an incredible amount of meaning as we construct that score and bring it to life. Let's also consider the story of the paralytic man in Mark 
chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 that we looked at last week. This is a micro story. We can say those 12 verses there are one contained micro story within the Gospel of Mark. But also, if we situate that within the middle level of narrative, we can say that in Mark chapter 2 through 3, we have a series of stories that focus on opposition that Jesus encounters. In this way, this micro story about healing the paralytic in Mark chapter 2 then fits within this middle level of narrative where we have a number of stories that fit together to form a block of opposition against Jesus. And then you could take the entire Gospel of Mark itself as a macro narrative. It starts with John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and it ends with Jesus' crucifixion and death on the cross in Mark. And you have one macro narrative that fits the whole thing together. But we have to take it one step further because there's a mega macro narrative within the Bible. Because once you have the editors and the compilers of the canon selecting which texts are to be canonized and to become part of the recognized text within the church, you have them putting the New Testament text alongside the Hebrew scriptures and you get a mega macro narrative from Genesis to Revelation, from creation to the redemption of the world at the end of the ages. Now what I want to do for the rest of this video is really give you a tool to help you interpret and study a biblical narrative. And within this tool, there's two things that we're looking for. There is the ascetic dimension or the artistic dimension. We're looking at how the story is told and those artistic or those beautiful flourishes that the author brings. So remember, if Jesus dies around 33 AD, and most conservative scholars would put Mark somewhere written around 50 AD, He's been teaching and preaching these stories for 20 years in conjunction with other church leaders. So he's had a lot of practice telling this, and you see that artistic dimension coming through as he tells the story. The second thing is to look at those elements that the author includes. What is he going to pick and include in this story to communicate his meaning to you? This is something that really interests you, I'm going to give you two books that you can pick up, and neither of them are very long. The first one is Robert Alter's book, The Art of Biblical Narrative. Now, he's a Jewish scholar, and he primarily focuses on the Old Testament stories, but it is well worth reading. And the second one is by Tremper Longman III, Literary Approaches to Biblical Interpretation. And I will put both of those references in the Show More or the More Information section underneath this video. What I'm going to teach you is how to use what's called a narrative plot diagram. And the goal here is we're going to have like a very skeletal plot line that we're going to follow. And then I'm going to show you how to take all the elements that you see within the story and put it on that plot line. The goal of this is to construct on one page a really nice diagram that has a lot of graphical color words on it that help you to see the meaning and the flow and the focus of the story. I'm going to use Mark chapter 2 once again as a way to do this, and I'm going to go back and take my reading from last week's video and stick it in here just as a way to remind us what that story is all about. So let's take a look at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door and he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned him within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, 
I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now, our first step is to draw this sort of trapezoidal diagram, this narrative plot diagram that we're going to put this information on, and I'll explain why we're using a structure like this. The four points to this story that we need to realize is over here on the left, we have the introduction or setting the stage for the story. These ascending and descending lines on the side show how either the conflict, the problem, or the need of the story either intensifies or gets resolved on the right-hand side. And then the plateau across the top there, this is where the tension or the highest level of conflict will be held. Finally, on the other side, we have this little tail off. That's the conclusion. Oftentimes, the setting the stage and the conclusion at the very beginning and the end here not only help set the stage for the story, but they help transition us from the previous story into this one and then this one into the next story as well. So for setting our stage here, if we mark back up to Mark chapter 1, Jesus has just returned from having a very successful ministry out on the Galilean countryside. He's come back to his house in Capernaum, but the problem is there is no room, not even at the doorway, for people to listen or to see him. That then sets our transition right here in the corner where we move from the setting to the introduction of conflict. It's just beginning here and we're going to see how this intensifies. Now this line moving up here, this is how the story intensifies. One of the things to realize about biblical stories is that they intensify and they resolve very, very quickly. We don't do that when we tell our stories today. The way we tend to tell stories is that we tend to have a very long period of intensification and we reach a climax in the story and then we have a quick resolution. You could take any detective movie that you see on TV. Usually they're an hour long. And if you watch them, you'll notice that for about 47 to 50 minutes, you have an intensification of conflict and then all of a sudden, bingo, you have the climax, the big fight scene or the arrest, and then it resolves very quickly and that probably gives you a little teaser to get you to watch next week's episode. But this is the way we tell stories today. In the biblical text, they like to intensify the story very quickly and they like to resolve it very quickly and hold you at a plateau, not a climax, but hold you at a plateau for a long time. And I'll show you how that happens in this story. Now, the reason why I bring this up and I spent some time on it is because this is perhaps one of the most difficult things that modern readers and interpreters have to wrap their head around when it comes to interpreting a narrative in the Bible. We want a point or a climax or a pinnacle of resolution and the biblical stories like to hold you on a plateau for a long time. So let's go back to our story in Mark chapter 2. The conflict intensifies when we have these four men who come carrying the paralytic. But the problem is they can't get into the house. We've already been told that. So now they climb up on the roof. Literally, we can see the story intensifying here the way it's told. Pull the roof apart and then lower the man on his bed into the very center of this room where you have Jesus teaching and the scribes listening to him. It's very dramatic, but this also brings us up here to this top corner where the intensification now turns and we're on the plateau. Notice how the story shifts. It's focused on the problem. There's so many people, nobody can get in. The four men bringing the guy climbing up on the roof and now all of a sudden it shifts to Jesus. There's also a term from actions to dialogue. And also there's a shift from the four men and the paralytic to Jesus and the scribes. So we see how there's a major narrative term that takes place in the story here. And this is one of the things I was telling you, look at what the author is focusing on and what he's bringing to your attention and saying, this is what you need to pay attention to. Don't listen to that poor guy down there on the bed. Listen to what Jesus says and the scribes are thinking. I would also put right up here in this corner, they've just lowered the bed down, and now Jesus speaks. And he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus now speaks, and so we know, ah, we've got a round character on the scene here. Everybody else up to this point has been fairly flat. Now we have a round character, 
entering the scene. So not only do we shift from actions to dialogue, from these men to Jesus, but we also shift from simple or flat characters to round complex characters. Now across this top plateau line here, I would put the dialogue that's taking place. Now the dialogue of the scribes is really being voiced by Jesus. He knows what they're thinking. And so the scribes are questioning in their hearts what Jesus is saying, and they're expressing good theology. This man blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knows what they're thinking, and then he speaks again. He says, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or rise up, take your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise up, pick up your bed, and go home. This top line is entirely composed of dialogue. It is also composed of this back and forth between Jesus and the scribes. And it starts with Jesus' statement over here about your sins are forgiven. And then it ends over here when Jesus says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. I say to you, pick up your bed and go home. Now the resolution, notice how quickly this story resolves itself. The man gets up and leaves the room. He goes out, half of a verse. As I said, the intensification and the resolution of biblical stories tend to happen very, very quickly, and they want to hold you on that plateau of conflict or need, something that needs to get resolved. What is the central theme of this story? And it's got to be discussed up there on the top line. And then finally, over here on the conclusion, we have the statement from the, everybody that's in the room there, the crowd, when they cry out, we have never seen anything like this. Mark is giving you sort of a punchline or a takeaway at the very end there for this story. Now, when you're constructing a narrative plot diagram, there's a couple of things I would suggest. First off, you wanna make sure that you get the entire story. Second thing I would suggest is draw the diagram by hand. Get out a sheet of paper, pencil, colored markers, all that sort of stuff, and get creative and have fun. Remember, you're the only one who's going to see this, so you don't have to worry about becoming a Picasso or anything like that. But I've taught this method for over 20 years, and I can tell you, if you try and do it by computer, it's not going to come out nearly as well as if you do it by hand. Now, after you've got it where you want by hand, then you can always use a computer and transfer it to a computer diagram. Second, you want to put words from the text on your diagram. Don't just include little verse numbers, but put the text in as well. And also, it's very helpful if you put the verse numbers, because then you know when you look at it exactly where it is in the story there, and it helps you go back and cross compare things. Use colors, little symbols, arrows, lightning bolts, whatever you want. You want to get creative. This really helps the meaning of the text jump right off the page at you. Now, in order to illustrate this, I've got two diagrams here that I took photographs of when I was teaching in Latin America. The first one here is a hand-drawn diagram. Now, if you're like most of us, you probably can't read Spanish that well, but notice how just using these little diagrams and colors throughout the diagram here, the meaning of this story jumps off the page at you. The second one here, they did it by hand and then they put it in on a computer because they didn't feel like their handwriting was all that neat. Once again, notice how they've taken all the elements of that story that they thought were important and put that on the diagram here. In both cases, the meaning of this story jumps off the page at you and you can take a look at them and interpret the story based on those diagrams. The final thing that I would say is somewhere on the diagram, put in a summary statement. What is this story all about? You have this very dramatic story that's meant to illustrate the central theme that Jesus has authority on earth to forgive sins. So you've done your diagram, you've seen the big point, you've had a great deal of fun doing this. So what? Well, I think there's three takeaways from doing a narrative plot diagram. On the personal side, it really gives you another tool and another way to interpret a biblical story. Second thing that does is if you're in ministry, let's say you're a pastor, you can take that narrative plot diagram up into the pulpit with you. And if you just preach through that, you have got an outline for that story. 
or maybe put a series of images in PowerPoint slides and then you can project them up on a screen as you go through. So you can use the diagram for teaching. The third thing you can do is you can use this in teaching for a small group or a Sunday school type class. All you need to do is grab a couple big sheets of paper, some crayons, and go in and just throw it down. So let them draw out the story and have fun. The amazing thing is when they're all done drawing their diagrams, they can then teach the story. You don't have to tell everybody what the story is about or what it means. Allow them to discover it and teach it to one another. Now at the very beginning of this video, I said I was giving away a copy of this book, Living Parables. And I've really found this a very stimulating read. They take the parables which are told in Jesus' context, a Jewish agrarian countryside from 2,000 years ago, and they bring it up into contemporary language and ideas and thought patterns. Now, if you want to win a copy of this, here's what you need to do. First off, you need to be a subscriber to the channel. The second thing is you need to have a U.S. mailing address because mailing books overseas is very expensive. Hopefully, sometime in the future, maybe we can land some big donor and we can give away some really cool swag to various people around the world because I really think getting material like this to people in developing countries is incredibly important. Third thing you need to do is you need to leave a comment under this video or in the next video about why you would like to read this book on the parables. It could be anything at all. And I'm going to look at the comments and I'll pick what I think is the best comment that somebody leaves and announce the winner in two weeks from now. It's just a little way to make the channel a little bit more exciting, spice things up, you know. Until next week, I will leave you with the word of peace. Peace.